So I'm Andrew Caroli, Dean of the Cornell S.C. Johnson College of Business, and very proud to say I'm also the Chair of the Advisory Board for SEBA. Um, and I've been, it's been a great pleasure to, uh, to work with Elena Iancova well, from the beginning, from the very beginning. Um, and I, I wonder, if, just before we get started, whether we could just all together join with me in applause thanking Elena for all of her incredible work. <laughs> Proud, we're very proud of, uh, of, of Elena. So I, my job is to introduce Professor Whittingham. We're going to have a little uh, back and forth, like a, kind of like a fireside chat afterwards, but there'll be a chance for you to ask questions as well. We'll come around with microphones to make sure your questions get asked. Uh, as Elena mentioned, uh, he's a professor of chemistry. He's the director of the material science and engineering program here at BU. Uh, and of course, the Nobel laureate in chemistry in 2019. Um, he is uh, absolutely a key figure in the history of the development of lithium-ion battery, uh, uh, which has literally changed everything from everything for everybody, uh, from mobile tel telephones to electric vehicles. Uh, it's just changing all of our lives. Um, he grew up in Nottingham, England, uh, and he read chemistry, as they say, in Oxford uh, at New College. Uh, he earned a BA, MA, and a DPhil there. Uh, he worked at Stanford as a postdoc, went straight into industry um, uh, at Exxon and Schlumberger, and then uh, for many years, as, as I understand it, before ultimately joining BU. Um, his accomplishments are, are so, so many uh, to list. Um, we, we are all so, so grateful and to have this opportunity to listen to Professor Whittingham talk about um, the things that inspire him. And um, uh, I'm gonna hand it over to you. Do you have a microphone now? Yeah. So, so thank you everybody. Um, welcome here, and I'd like to welcome two people in particular, Mayor Jackson, and we'll describe why in a few moments, and our long-term friend, Jim Menke, at the back there with the camera. So let me... Um, Um, so we've been very active in the battery area here. As I said at the Nobel talk, and I say at most of my talks, raise your hand if you do not have a lithium battery on you right now. <laughs> most of you have one or more on, with you. And really, the lithium battery has disrupted the lives of most of the older folks here, the younger folks know your time when there were no lithium batteries. So we have instant communication these days, which we didn't use to have. This has obviously caused some problems with newspapers, but um, no, it doesn't matter where we are in the world, we know what's going on everywhere. So I want to really describe a little bit of the background of the lithium batteries. I'm not going to get into any chemistry at all. So I'm really going to lay the foundation, and my colleagues like Bill Acker will get into some of the, we like the meat later on. So I'd like to first mention, um, the folks who really are driving this activity, that's the US Department of Energy, they've supported me for 30 plus years. They're supporting most of us in this business in the States. And as you know, I'm here. I no longer run the material science and engineering program. I have my hands full with um, the battery business these days and giving talks around and explaining what, why we need batteries and why it's such a, so important for the United States to build this manufacturing industry. And I was at Oswego, just north of here yesterday, in a slightly different setting, I gave my talk in the ice hockey arena <laughs> with a big scoreboard with a, the talk on it. And I said, we're desperate for electrical engineers with power engineering experience. I had about six of them come up to me at the end of the talk. So those of you who are from companies who want electric engineers with power experience, Soon the Oswego is training them, and they will be happy to do internships and so on. So this is what we're worried about today. These are, you could argue, man-made, but indirectly. I show you a picture of um, Germany at the top, and beneath that, I think this is um, Kentucky. In the middle is the 
um, Banff National Park, and this was the Victoria Glacier. You can now just see it all the way in the background. It used to be all over this ground 15, 20 years ago. Top right is a fire in Chile. Beneath that is the fire in Colorado. All these were from last summer. So these are not over a long period. This is what's happening with the changes in the climate. And you know, we can address those just as we address um, communication. But let me start at the beginning. This is where we started early 1970s. For those who don't remember, there was a company then called Esso. It then converted to Exxon, now Exxon Mobil. They were going to be an energy company. They were the largest manufacturer of solar photovoltaic in the United States. They did nuclear reprocessing for the United States, and they got into batteries, fuel cells, and the rest of it. And then they got out. I think the world might have been a slightly different place had they stayed in there. But these are two of the batteries we made in, in those days. A paperweight we gave away to customers. Um, this one it sits on my desk still, it's still working. We built it, we think, about 1975. So a good lithium battery will last, I won't say forever, but if you have one in a pacemaker, it's a good sign that it will last as long. <laughs> Beneath that is one cell we built for electric vehicles. Exxon wanted to build electric cars. And this one's about six inches by four inches by about an inch thick. We took these to the EV show in Chicago in 1977. So that's where we stood then. And in the middle is a, the original US patent on the lithium ion batteries. Where are we today? These are some of the examples of electric vehicles. And I picked the forklift truck from Raymond, a local company, and the bus from BAE Systems. There's a bus there from Mercedes, which has a solid state battery in it. And then um, several other vehicles, including the new BMW, um, a small Italian um, two-seater, which you can rent if you go to Bermuda, and two large trucks. So we've come from essentially nothing to a um, full <coughs> gamut of um, vehicles. And you can buy all these today. So that, that's where we stand. The only limitation on you buying them is the supply chain. They can't make them fast. If you talk to Ford, you want one of their Mustangs or the electric F-150, you're waiting, I think, 12 months right now. Another place where the batteries are being used now. Whilst we were in Stockholm for the Nobel ceremony, two physicists and I talked to the astronauts live on the International Space Station. And there was, what was amazing, there's no delay whatsoever. We talked and they responded. That was important. And they're just replaced all the old nickel metal hydride in the space station with lithium ion. They weighed half as much, took up half the volume, and were going to last twice as long. So lithium ion batteries are everywhere. If you've got any garden tools, I think even if you've got um, electric shavers, they're all lithium ion today. It's partly because NICAD was banned, and they're not as good. If we're really going to go to renewable energy, we've got to store that energy because, as we all know, in the Binghamton area, the sun doesn't shine all the time, and it certainly doesn't shine at night. So if we store the energy in the daytime, then we can use it at night time. And I show a, a West Virginia wind farm there, and beneath that, a huge solar storage facility in California. This is 1.6 gigawatt hours. They've got permission to go to five gigawatt hours. The issue in California right now is to make too much solar energy in the middle of the day. They can now store it in this facility. And the big plus of this particular facility, this is an old gas-fired um, power station. So all the utility infrastructure is already there. So you just put the batteries in and connect it up. So to make any storage facility really economically viable, it needs to be where you've got the grid infrastructure. So we can do all that, but none of those batteries are made by Americans. We have to change that. There's at least one country in this world where it's their national goal to dominate electric vehicles and batteries. And as we learned with COVID, we cannot have any one country dominating the supply chain. That's why you see this huge initiative coming out from Biden's administration to rebuild 
the supply chain. And I think again, Bill Ackham may say something here was at this library's meeting yesterday. It's both security and sustainability. We can't have a sustainable system where all the materials travel to one country. And you look at some of the materials, it can take us 30 to 50,000 miles from the mine to the finished product, which is crazy. Yeah. And um, basically, each region needs its own supply chain, its own infrastructure, and that includes the workforce as well as the materials. But we as scientists have to basically take out all the critical materials. Can we eliminate all the cobalt? This comes from the Congo, which is no, 50 uh, percent of its child labor. Can we get rid of the rare earths from the magnets? Most of which again comes from China and come up with some lower cost materials. And there's no reason why we can't um, you know, source graphite and carbon atoms <coughs> locally within the Americas. We have the mineral resources to do this. And you notice I used the word America there. We're pushing hard back hard on the federal government. Stop talking about the US supply chain. Some of us are that we're, what, 100 miles from Canada. They have a lot of nickel. They have a lot of lithium. They have some graphite. And they have a huge amount of clean hydropower to process these materials. So we have to work as a team, not as separate entities. Um, parts of this country, if you go south, there's plenty of sunshine to make clean energy. The question we have to ask ourselves, does America have the will to do it? And if we do, can we put it together in such a form that it doesn't change every two or four years as the party in power changes? We have to have something that's more coherent, just as um, Europe is doing. So let me just finish with a, a few comments. The type of batteries we use today, they're not going to change in the next five or ten years. You may hear a lot of hype about how we've got these great new things in the double. Double the present, one's lower cost. You're not going to see that for five or ten years because the lithium battery business is so huge. Any new system will have to generate its own market to cut the price down. Um, so sustainability <coughs> is an issue. It takes 60 to 80 kilowatt hours today to make a one kilowatt hour battery. A lot of that's in the processing, in the shipping. We should better cut that back. We have to leapfrog the Asians and do better than they do. I've already talked about the regional supply chain. Um, we've got to have clean recycling technologies, and I emphasize clean. We can't use brute force and ignorance. In other words, you can't do all these things in a pot and burn them. We've got to try to take the materials out and reuse them without creating any problems with these fluoride gases and so on. And the key thing that's lacking in this country, anybody who's made an invention in batteries in this country want to take it to the next step, you can't do it. You send it to a colleague in China and they'll make the batteries for you and send them back. So we have to get in a position where we can say, these batteries are made in America and you'll stamp on the side of them made in America. So we need an ecosystem for clean energy. Clearly, to do all this, we also have to have a, a workforce that's trained. We don't really have that right now. So there's a lot of new gigafactories being built. They're being built by Asian companies. And right now, they're bringing their own workforce in to get it going and to let you train the local one. But the key point I want to make is in this figure, and you probably can't see it too well. The left-hand side is all the great things we do in America, or most of the intellectual property is American. As I said, but then we then ship it to Asia, just like Exxon did, and then they take it over. We have to do that here. So what we have proposed to the EDA is to build a, what we call, Battery New York facility in Endicott, in one of the old IBM buildings. This will allow us to develop new manufacturing technologies to leapfrog the agents, which will be more efficient. Um, it will allow the manufacture of full-size cells, both pouch and cylindrical, so companies can test out things. Now they can make, say, 1,000 or 500 cells of different um, parameters and see how well they work. And then we, we reduce the risk when we go to the gigafactory. And I should emphasize clearly, Imperium 3 is building a gigafactory over there built on technology developed 
in this building. So we're happy there, but I think you know, we want to not just have IM3 New York in Endicott, we'd like to have six or seven bigger factories in Endicott and all the supply chains in Endicott as well. So we can rebuild Endicott, rebuild the thousands of workers who are there. When I came here, Festival Parkway was full of thousands of IBM engineers. It'd be nice to get back to that again. And I'll stop there and we can do our oh, Q&A. Fantastic. Gentlemen, we're gonna we're gonna invite you to have uh, I think we have about 10 10 15 minutes more of question and answer so I'm gonna start if you don't mind um, and so clearly this lithium-ion technology is what's hastening us to move from fossil fuels to cleaner energy um, but I've read so many interviews with you uh, Professor Whittingham where you talk about the fact that the acceleration is just not happening fast enough and you mentioned a few of the headwinds that are that are here. I wonder if you could just sort of double down and just sort of identify what you think are the, the, the most powerful headwinds that are blocking us from, from advancing as quickly as we can. I think a number of the speakers later today, I think we'll get into this. Yeah. But we need direct investment from the government to get started. We can't compete against the Chinese who have that direct investment. The Chinese may not give dollars to the company to do the factory. They'll give them the land free. They'll give them the permitting, so they get the permit to be done in a few months. So in China, they can take it to the whole bigger factory before I think you can get the first permit in the United States. If you want to um, get a mine going, say to make cobalt or lithium or whatever, in the US you're talking 20, 10 to 20 years to get full permit. It, it's crazy. So no, we have to get over that, and it's my understanding that Biden just recently vetoed a copper mine in Arizona. Copper is a critical element, so we have to get everybody on the same track. But I think it's the investment and taking some of the risk. Europe is putting several billion dollars into their supply chain and battery effort. It's a unified effort across all the countries. So I'm, I'm hearing sort of regulatory, regulatory, <laughs> restrictions or hesitations, uh, that, that seems to be it. And then, then there's also this message of reshoring. Yes. Reshoring some of the, the, the actual development. Yes. That's really, really good. Yes. Now I know you've got, a, we're gonna showcase some of this later on today, but I wonder if you can give, give us a little, for those of us who are not, not technically, uh, have a technical understanding of what you do, what are, the, what are the ways in which you're specifically, through the companies you're affiliated with, specifically trying to hasten this development. You see this opportunity and, and there's specific ways. I wonder if you could share some. Well, I said we're trying to fill this gap in the middle. Right. So companies do not have to go to Asia. And clearly, you know, I said Bill is back there. He's mm -hmm. executive director of New York Best and he's the one who contracts with all the companies. And there's a huge effort now of the federal government on libraries trying to get the companies involved what their needs are. But we need companies to really tell us what are their needs, what's stopping them advancing faster. But obviously, no. right now, there's too many issues in the world. So lithium batteries, since January, I think have gone up like 10 to 20%. And it should be coming down. So until we can get this supply chain issue straightened out. And it's clear, it's not just batteries, it's semiconductors, it's everything you can think about. But, but if we don't have a domestic effort there, then it's even worse. So uh, we'll, I'll walk around, and, or maybe somebody can help me with some of the microphones. If there are questions that are coming around, Candice, you're going to help us out here. So another thing that I've read is talking about doubling the energy density of batteries, and how important that is. Um, can you, again, is that, is that going to be related to what you were just talking about, or is this the importance of doing that? Why is that so important? now yes does we have a large r&d effort today batteries are 250 watt hours per kilogram at the cell level our goal is to get it to um the 500 level so there's a what's called a doe battery 500 consortium to get us there because basically the components of today's lithium-ion batteries haven't changed much since 
since 1990. Particularly the anode, which is where the graphite is, that's essentially the same. We need 72 grams of graphite to carry 7 grams of lithium. And it takes up half the volume of cells. So a lot of the research is can we get rid of that graphite? If we can do that, then we can double the energy density of cells. And we'll cut out that need in that part of the supply chain. So it was, you know, there's some R&D which you get is higher. In the end, it's really lifetime cost that's probably more important than anything else, particularly to our industrial colleagues here and the end users. And we can do that here. Yes. We can do that. We are doing some of that. And we are doing it here. So ladies and gentlemen, questions for Professor Winningham. Uh, Candice will be here with a microphone. Uh, we've got one right here. And one in the back there, Candice. I'm told you couldn't hear me, but it's way more important that you hear him than you hear me. Um, just, just what do you feel you need to do from a community perspective to, I'm going to say the word, convince the residents of Endicott that this type of manufacturing is not going to cause them issues? I mean, in the past, they were very sensitive to the reasons to pollution issues other things that have fallen through. What do you have to do to convince them this is a good thing? I think we have to assure them that we're not using too many toxic materials and where we do it, they're under control. And I think it's important to remember that um, if you store energy, same as storing gasoline, energy can go wrong. So we have to put all the safety protections in place. We are trying something a new effort that we're planning in Endicott. We want to get rid of all the toxic materials, anything that might be sensed to be toxic. These are organics, and so we're looking at removing those. York is probably going to ban them next year, so I think it's very surely we're going to ban them. Right now, I'm sure I can pay them too, can tell you how much it costs, but you talk about millions of dollars spent to make sure none of this stuff gets in the environment. They don't want to get in the environment because it costs a lot of money the chemicals that they want to recover them all and reuse them over and over again. So there's none of these toxic chlorochemicals that you know, you use to clean chips and things like that. Um, I'm, my question revolves around the new manufacturing approaches to leapfrog Asia. I work for Siemens Industry, right. does a lot of uh, digitalization of, of industrial processes and I, I'm curious to hear what you're envisioning, and, and it might even piggyback a little bit on the last question of, are these manufacturing processes cleaner? Do more of them happen in a simulation before materials are actually expended? Just would love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, I just discussed that with your CEO last week in California. <laughs> uh, so Siemens is very interested in clean energy. They're getting out, my understanding from him, getting out of all what we call the dirty energy businesses. So um, what we hope to do is stop this old method of um, making coatings using base organic liquids. We can actually spot them, use semiconductor type technology, so we just lay it down one layer after the other. Applied materials are starting to do that. So we're looking at technologies where there's less wastage, and then the present battery plant Again, in Pyramid 3, correct me on this, you're talking 10 15 percent wastage in the manufacturing. That then has to go back into the recycling plants. So if we can get rid of some of that, we'll cut the cost down. But I think clearly, eventually, a lot of these plants are going to be quite well automated. And I think that will help with it. It's getting away from the old um, making pastes and coating those pastes down, and can we do it in a, a cleaner environment? Morning, Stan. Adam Flint here. I'm over on this side. Um, something you said to me a few years ago really stuck with me, which is that uh, as a materials scientist, uh, obviously a very good one, you understood the uh, barriers that we face in uh, politics and education and perception, um, which is an area uh, all to itself that perhaps we need to devote more time to. And I guess my question is, um, because from my, what I've seen, what's going on in Endicott is actually not known to the vast majority of people who live here. It's not known to the vast majority of the people who work at this campus. 
what can Binghamton University do, uh, first and foremost, to make sure that students, faculty, and staff are aware of what's going on here, uh, and, and then really connect that up with the community? Thank you. I think we have to work closer with the community. We work closely with Mayor Jackson. We need to work maybe with the high schools. So we educate them of what's going on, what clean energy is, and why it's so important. Um, I'm not sure how we get the folks on this campus, because we do everything on this campus. Yeah. You know, we can wave the flag more, but I think that we have to educate the community much more. Remember, we've been essentially in lockdown for what, two, three years now. We can't easily go out and have community meetings, and I think when you have community meetings, it's much better to have them face-to-face -face than on Zoom. But then you can face somebody and really describe what you're trying to do. And I think um, the IM3 New York people have a number of tours to their facility, people can see what's going on there. If we build this battery in New York facility and get the money for that in Endicott, the facility there will, will be mostly, or a lot of it, glass on the facility, just as the Chinese do. So we bring tour groups through, they can see exactly what we're doing and how clean it is. and. Um, they can see why we're doing it. And I think most people around here know about electric vehicles. I think they're not entirely happy that electric vehicles aren't so great in two feet of snow, but um, <laughs> we'll get there with that at some point. And um, everybody has to do more education, but the people who are trying to send the information to have to be willing to receive it. It's got to be a two-way street, but I think certainly with Andy, but we're going to work very hard to that we have an educated population. But time for one more question. Anybody want to ask that burning question? Mayor Jackson would like to up here, Candace. Um, <laughs> I just want to say that the problem in Endicott isn't really environmental. It's all brought on by politics. And things are starting to level off a little bit in Endicott, so I think you're going to find that things are going to go a lot smoother. And uh, I, I do believe you have a town hall plan for somewhere in Endicott to show people the facility. I know today we're going there. And I think what we need is another town hall at the high school, bringing a lot of the people on that the Huron campus, what should be called Phoenix campus now, and let people just come in and ask questions on a face-to-face -face basis like this, and I think that's going to make a really big difference. So I just wanted to pass that on. So thank you. Sounds Here's like some nice support locally. Yes. Well, one well, one more. We have one more. One more question. Yeah, Professor, uh, is your focus on the university here just uh, the technology and manufacturing, or are you also focused on the recycling uh, aspects, which are relatively new if, if you're familiar with the industry recycling lithium is now be or lithium batteries is now being uh, done in uh, I'm, I'm from Reno and we've got redwood out there and uh, one other facility but I'm not aware of any other uh, areas that are recycling lithium uh, batteries at this time well, the, the largest I think Recycling facility in the United States is probably in Kodak Park in Rochester, New York, run by Lithium Cycle. So they're going to partner with us on our battery in New York effort. I have ex students in, um, at Virginia Tech working on lithium recycling. So on the campus itself, we're not doing anything at the moment that I'm aware of. But um, yeah. here and that colleagues at the other campuses in New York State. We do everything from the very fundamental atomic level. I should emphasize, we have these synchrotron facilities at Brookhaven and at Cornell that can look at these things at the atomic level. The one at Brookhaven also take a full operating battery and watch what the atoms are doing as you're charging and discharging. And that's available to anybody. And I think I did nice surgery or ESD paid for a lot of that particular facility. So, you know, we have the cables, we do everything from the beginning to the end, and we have, obviously have a lot of people in the region doing all the um, electronic controls of these systems. We shouldn't forget that it's not just, not just the electrochemistry, you have to put it into a package that so actually works. So I'm sure our colleagues from Raymond and BA will tell us 
maybe getting the cell is the easiest part. Once you can get hold of it, then putting it together in a working pack package that will last forever and satisfy the customer. Well, Professor Whittingham, that's wonderful. Thank you so much for taking the time today. Please.